Hey everybody, can you hear? So before we get going, I decided to record a little disclaimer just so I don't waste anybody's time. The Path of Exile videos that I post on my channel are not meant for people who play at the highest levels of skill. This is for people who are relatively new to the game and are looking for ideas for how to progress through the game. So these will mostly be kind of builds that are good for people leveling through Acts 1 through 5. And this league, I'll be changing things up a little bit and also doing some builds that would be good for uh, builds that would go from Act 6 through the end of the game. But just a couple of each of those. That's all I'm doing this league. And also, I don't use Path of Building. That's not a part of my process. I might post a link in the description with a, an unlisted video showing what my actual process is for creating builds for anyone who's interested in how I do that. Other than that, I don't want to keep any of you here who aren't interested in that kind of content here any longer than you need to be, so you're stopping by, and those of you who are still here, let's get going.
And with the introductions out of the way, I'd like to introduce you all to my Facebreaker Berserker. Now, before I go into the gems, gear, and passives that are being used in this build, I just want to preface this whole section by saying that this isn't some kind of game-breaking build in any form. Honestly, if there's anything that we're breaking in this build, it's making unarmed attacks viable as a damage source. That's really all we're doing. Uh, so there's a lot of uniques in this build, but they're in this build specifically to make this an unarmed attack build. But you could honestly replace all of the unarmed attack stuff and turn this into a much better build using any kind of weapon. <laughs> like uh, the entire reason why this is a face breaker build is because, not because I happen to have a face breaker, which is this unique here that causes physical damage from unarmed attacks to deal a tremendous amount more damage. It's not because of this, it's because I happen to find this. I had, I've had this for I don't know how long, but finding this is the reason why I decided to make this a facebreaker build. And it's not because the modifiers to claw uh, damage, uh, call damage, attack speed, and crit chance also apply to unarmed, the unarmed values. It's because of the top stanza there of plus 7% to unarmed melee attack critical strike chance which means that your unarmed attacks have a seven percent unarmed attack speed i'm sorry <laughs> have a seven percent unarmed melee critical strike chance because without that you can see that our crit chance right here is 27 percent if we take this off we have no critical strike chance so, like, the face breakers, if you don't have critical strike in the build, then, you know, the critical strike multiplier doesn't do anything for you. Yeah, you could still work on the, uh, like, with the reduced enemy stun threshold, you could still work into that. But, like, without a source of giving your, uh, your unarmed attacks crit chance, you're not really getting the most out of this particular piece. Because, you know, because obviously this is a very low-level piece of gear. And he has 46 evasion and 11 energy shield. Now, this is not a high-level item. So if you're going to build around it, you, know, you want to be building around it with the most benefits possible. And if I hadn't found this this past league, then I would not have gone for a facebreaker build this week. <laughs> I would, not, this is not, this, I would not be showing you this if I hadn't found this... Uh, this talisman. It would be, I probably would have done a wand build berserker, which sounds weird, but you know. <laughs> it honestly isn't much weirder than what I did here, but it would have been more viable than this. Because uh, this is something that works, obviously. I mean, I showed it in a map doing stuff. <laughs> but this works. It's just that this is something that isn't a huge step up from doing anything else. Yes, I just want to get out of the way that, you know, I, I, I don't recommend this because of some kind of insane viability. I recommend this because it's fun. You know, it's very interesting. <laughs> With that, let's get into the parts that make this work. I decided to fit things up a bit make it a little different than how I usually do my build videos. So this time I'm going to be covering where our damage comes from, then where our recovery comes from, and then where our defenses come from. So damage wise, our main source of damage is that we are using Inferno Blow. We have it on this five link chest piece. And we are supporting Inferno Blow with two, with two of the new support gems. So Sadism and Controlled Blaze. Combining these two isn't particularly optimal. But because of the way that Inferno Blow works, we make up for the negatives that occur when combining these two. Just a quick explanation as to what I'm referring to by 
these two kind of not working together. Uh, the way that controlled blaze works, the more times that you have paused and ignite recently, the less overall damage you do. Like your ignites will do more, but your other damage that are not ignites will do less. And then what sadism does is it causes your ailments to tick down faster, but also expire faster. And the reason that combined, I feel these work well with Infernal Blow is that Inferno Blow causes enemies to be applied with a charge debuff that once you reach a certain threshold, they just explode, you know, like an heal damage to surrounding enemies. So it's a nice, uh, like crowd clearer. But more importantly, since, uh, our intention is to keep on stacking up those charge debuffs in order to have those popping off in pretty regular intervals at the time controlled blaze really starts to negatively affect us sadism will most likely have caused any ignites that we were causing using this skill to have petered out for the most part bringing us towards our eventual conclusion of relying primarily on non-ignite sources for our damage. So these two are more for like getting a nice amount of damage early on, like you know, like at the start, and then eventually we're not really causing ignites using this skill anymore. Like this skill is really being carried from that point forward by our faster attacks and our ruthless, which if you've never used with this so the ruthless support before, this makes it that well, if you played a Marauder then or if you played a Marauder recently, then you probably used Ruthless, since that's the gem they give you now on the beach. But with Ruthless, every third hit is a much harder hit. That's what it does. So you have a nice source of getting some additional damage in, which then translates to some bigger ignites early on, which then eventually peter out from that. And the reason that they peter out is actually that we are running the Ascendancy skills Flawless Savagery, which give us increased physical damage whenever uh, if we've dealt a Critical Strike recently, along with increased Critical Strike Multiplier and more Critical Strike Chance. But more importantly, Blitz, which makes it that we build up Blitz charges as we deal Critical Strikes. And once we're at max Critical... I'm sorry, <laughs> once we're at max blitz charges, then our critical strike chance will essentially be greatly reduced to the point where we're most likely not going to be dealing a critical strike with any kind of frequency. And without critical strikes as part of our kind of late encounter damage formula, the only source of ignite we have is the implicit ignite on the controlled blaze or gem itself. But we're not, we have not specialized in ignite in any way. The only ignite is from the gem. And I make a point of pointing that out because we are using the alchemist mark in this build. Now, the reason we're using alchemist mark is that alchemist mark causes us to gain flash charges on hit. Which I know like a, like that sounds underwhelming, but do keep in mind that it's flask charges. It's not life flask charges. It's not mana flask charges. It's flask charges. Meaning that, you know, whatever you're lacking on, that's what's going to be getting built up. So, since we're running Overflowing Chalice here, which is a unique flask that creates consecrated ground on use and increases your damage which you know are just the implicit benefits of having a sulfur flask and we've we've uh, instilled it to use all of its charges when it reaches full you know this gives us a means of using that flask 
far more commonly. Especially during a long combat encounter. And just as importantly, causes us to create burning ground based on the strongest ignite on the enemy that has a base duration of 4 seconds. So, essentially we mark the enemy and we start slamming them with our Infernal Blow and then occasionally we'll be creating consecrated ground and burning ground around us to give us some extra damage utility alongside our main combat skill. And while I wasn't using it and don't even have it set on my skill bar, I also have Poisonous Concoction being supported by Greater Multiple Projectiles in here. And the reason for this is that it also combos with Alchemist Mark so that if you ever feel like your damage is being affected too heavily by Controlled Blaze, then you have another way to kind of offset that with another damage type while we wait for Controlled Blaze to kind of peter off. But as you can see, since I, I don't have it on my bar because I felt that Controlled Blaze was not hampering me by just focusing on Infernal Blow. Like I was able to get by just fine just using my main attack skill. But if you are someone who is an act actually a skilled player, because I am not skilled at games in any way. I am a dumb dummy who can't really focus on multiple things at the same time. So for me, like, you know, like, like trying to run around, pick an enemy, focus on, on what, uh, what mods they have, as well as paying attention to my health, my mana, my cooldowns. Like my buffs, my whatever debuffs are being applied to me. Like I can't do all of those things. But if you're some like if you're someone who actually can play the game and keep track of those things at the same time, then a kind of fun thing you can do with this setup is when your blitz charges get all the way up, if you switch over to poisonous concoction, then that goes wild. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it just it looks really cool when <laughs> when you're at full bliss charges and using this skill and i highly recommend trying it if you're someone who is able to do that without getting themselves killed you know like actually pay attention to what's happening up here because I, I can't do it like it's impossible for me i've been playing this game for nine years you know like uh, it's not something you can build up as a skill <laughs> Like, there's people who can do it and people who can't. I'm someone who can't. We're also using a precision aura because it grants us both increased critical strike chance and increased accuracy. And we really don't have a lot of accuracy in this build. Like, I think I, I have two sources of accuracy in the passives and that's about it. So having precision is very good for this. However, like, we don't really have a good source of mana upkeep. So, you you know, you can forego this for, <laughs> for more mana to use your main skill. I'm also using in both Intimidating Cry and Ancestral Cry. Intimidating Cry because it makes it that our exerted attacks deal double damage and can overwhelm physical damage reduction. And Ancestral Cry because... It lets us get the benefits of Ancestral Call without having to have that support on the gem. Essentially, you see a big group, you pop Ancestral Cry, you run into the group, you know, and then like you know, you're punching everything at the same time. <laughs> it's a great one to have in a in a melee strike build. Obviously, our face breakers do carry a lot of the weight when it comes to giving us unarmed damage, as well as giving us critical strike multiplier, but. I also ran through uh, the Crucible, not the Crucible, <laughs> I also ran through the Labyrinth to get uh, a Labyrinth buff on these. Though so these also trigger Decree of Fury on hit, which if I'm being honest, I don't actually remember what this does. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure it's the one that makes it that like fireballs kind of shoot out from you. But I could be remembering wrong, it might be the, like, the little meteor that like, strikes down every now and then. But essentially, like, you know, like you just want something 
something giving you a little more damage in here just so you know like the like the many hits that you're dealing with this skill like you know with our main skill get the most benefit out of them so anything that's on hit you know, any uh, labyrinth buff that's on hit is a good one to get right here our power ring here is giving us a little bit of physical damage to our attacks and the ruby ring is giving us some extra fire and lightning damage to our attacks and then in our passive build, as I mentioned, we're using Flawless Savagery and Blitz as part of our Ascendancy build. And also Crave the Slaughter, which makes it that we gain Rage on hits. And also increases our Rage Cap. And then in the Marauder area, and we have Born to Fight, so more attack speed, more physical damage. And then we travel up to the Scion area here. And get more attack speed while making our rage loss, uh, make our rage deplete slower, and also gaining some more maximum rage, so we can have up to 70 rage, which is pretty great since the benefits of rage are that you gain attack damage, attack speed, and movement speed at different thresholds of rage points. So having seven, like if you can actually get up to 70 then this will be doing a lot of work for you. And if you choose to forego Blitz in favor of Rite of Ruin, then it can do even more for you. Though if you do choose to go for Rite of Ruin, then you may want to invest in more regen. Like I have some regen here, but not much. And very important, I also grab the Attack Mastery Monsters Cannot Block Your Attacks. This is something that I feel if you are using attacks in your build if you're not using spells then you want to go for any attack mastery cluster that happens to be near uh, where you're maneuvering around just to get this just because it's uh, it's really important like you know, like the like the enemy mod that's uh enemies block attacks and you know, like if you see the blocks attacks on you know on the enemy mod list you know that is way stronger than you'd think it is. Like, you know, like I, I remember in Crucible League with either, either my Deadeye or my Chieftain, and this is on YouTube, so you can verify this. <laughs> when I was playing through Act 1 with one of those characters, and I got into the little seaside cave where you get the All Flame for Fair Graves, I did a Crucible encounter in there, where one of the mobs took me 20 minutes because it had this mod. I'm not, not this mod. Because it had the blocks attack mod on it. 20 minutes. <laughs> In act one. You know, it, it was crazy. Like, like that, like this, like that, uh, that mod is incredibly powerful on an enemy. So if you're doing an attack build, I highly recommend getting this attack mastery. To just eliminate enemy block chance altogether, because that like you, know, like you do not want to have all of your damage just turned off because you aren't doing a spell damage build. <laughs> From there, we headed into the shadow area, where we start investing in claw passives. So more claw attack speed, more claw accuracy, life gain on hit with attacks. Increase physical damage, overwhelm physical damage reduction, which is a good one to have. And this big claw cluster here, or claw damage, claw attack speed. I'm pretty sure this uh, chance to steal charges thing with claws doesn't apply to our unarmed attack, so we're really just here for the damage and the attack speed. And critical strikes and multi crit multiplier. And a big one, just like I mentioned with my Golemancer build. We want to go for whatever local mark cluster we can in order to turn off enemy regeneration using our marks. Because enemy regen is crazy in this game. Once you reach a certain point, an enemy with regen will out heal any damage you can do unless you do tremendous amounts of damage. Oh. And this also has the added benefit of 
not only giving us increased damage against the marked enemies, but also giving us increased accuracy on the marked enemies. So like this here and this here are like all of the accuracy that we have in this build. And then down in this ranger area here, I grabbed all of the dexterity nodes that are in this radius because we are using the pugilist gem, which is a radio gem that gives us increased evasion, claw damage, and melee physical damage with unarmed attacks based on the dexterity and range. And so this gives us, as you can see in the little uh, brown one on the bottom left there, I'm sorry, bottom right there, now we get an increased 36% to melee physical damage with unarmed attacks, physical da increased physical damage, claws, and 36% increased evasion rating. And obviously, just like the face breaker and the Rigwald curse, like you know, like this is part of the formula of why I did this build altogether. If I didn't have all three of these things, then I wouldn't have thought to even do this build. You know, like it, it was the confluence of being able to do a viable unarmed attack build, which is why I did this. But we have lots of critical strike multiplier, lots of increased attack speed to our unarmed attacks because of how we've invested in all attack speed. We have lots of crit chance for our unarmed attacks because of how we've invested in crit chance with our with claws. And we have lots of increased unarmed damage because of how we've invested in claws and everything else we've invested in here. Now that we've talked about how we deal damage, let's talk about how we heal our damage. We we're also using the Enduring Cry gem. This is something that I feel is a great utility skill for any build because it just gives you a very nice amount of, of healing that essentially makes it just an extra life flask that you have just sitting on your skill bar. I mean, obviously it isn't the same as a life flask, but that healing is occurring over one second, which technically makes it better than a life flask. Then in the Marauder area, we have Warrior's Blood, which gives us increased life regeneration. Over in the Shadow area, oh, well, Shadow Ranger area, we took both the flask cluster and recovery cluster here. So we have, like we're gaining life and mana charges, mana fast charges over time. And we are gaining life on hit. And this excess sustenance is actually a huge one for us because it gives us a 15% chance to gain 200 life on hit with attacks. And once our blitz charges are high enough, like we're attacking very fast. Uh, you can see like we were doing like I think five to six attacks per second uh, once all of our blitz charges were up. So, you know, this is happening very frequently and able to keep us up quite well. And also got the mastery that gives us just flat regen. I also have these notes here. So more life and mana on hit. And... Ever thief for the little bit of life and mana leech. I don't like to depend on leech with certain characters. So if, like if I'm not doing, if I'm not doing a vow, <laughs> a vow pack thing, then I try to stay. I try to keep like without vow pact. I like to avoid getting leech in most builds just because. If you have leech, but you don't have corrupted blood cannot be inflicted on you, then it can make recovery very difficult. So I usually avoid this, but because we have so many sources of life gain on hit and also regen, I'm not, we don't have a lot of regen, but we have some regen, like we're able to offset any corrupted blood that may occur if we happen to hit a corrupted blood enemy. 
mind you, you don't necessarily have to hit a corrupted blood enemy to gain corrupted blood. Since, you know, like there's that nemesis mod that just makes those types of enemies cause you to gain corrupted blood just for being near them, which is stupid, but whatever. At least, you know, like when it was based on leech, it made sense. <laughs> and now we'll go over our defenses. So we are primarily looking at armor and evasion as our defense sources. Our gloves are not participating in our defense in any way. It's a tiny amount of evasion energy shield and it doesn't provide us any elemental resistances or chaos resistance at all. So like this actually hurts us defensively to even have on, but it enables the build, which is why we tolerate it. Our belt of the deceiver here is pulling a lot of, uh, is doing a lot of work for us as far as keeping our defenses up. So while sure it has, you know, it gives us more strength and no physical damage and nearby enemies are intimidated. Like those aren't the reasons to have this. The reasons to have this are that you take reduced damage from critical strikes, you have extra flat life, and you have resistances to all elements. Like that's that's the main work that this does for us. And armor evasion on our boots, as well as a very nice amount of cold and lightning resistance, as well as some flat life and regen. And I crafted on a large amount of extra armor evasion on it. Our power is giving us a very nice amount of flat life and a good amount of fire and cold resistance. And the ruby ring is giving us a good amount of fire, da fire resistance as well as resistance to all elements. Our helmet is giving us a good amount of armor and evasion. And I crafted on some flat life and it has some a little bit of implicit, well not implicit, it has a little bit of life and regen as part of the affixes, but there are no elemental resistances on this, which is why we are also running the Purity of Elements aura, so that we are able to cover our bases. Uh, this doesn't really like fully cap us out, and we're only overcapped on cold resistance. Then we're a little under cap on fire and on lightning, which isn't great. Like, you know, it'd be nice if, like, you know, this happened to have some elemental resistances on it, but it is what it is. Then our shield is a crucible shield that I built up. Gives us a nice amount of armor and evasion. Also has a good amount of flat life. And I crafted on some intelligence so that we could actually run purity of elements. But we don't really have a good amount of intelligence in the build. And Purity of Elements does have a pretty hefty intelligence requirement. The Crucible Tree that's on here gives us increased dexterity, evasion rating, chance to block, and um, in, uh, it gives us a essentially an implicit endurance charge that's always with us, which is just nice to have on. But, you know, it doesn't provide any elemental resistances either. So, <laughs> we have... An amulet that's not providing elemental resistances, shield that's not providing elemental resistances, a hat that's not providing elemental resistances, and gloves that aren't providing elemental resistances. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, like it was necessary. I was desperate for <laughs> for elemental resistance in this build. And then for our chest, we're using a full plate chest, so all armor, which gives us a little bit of regen, stun block recovery. Um, damage reflect and I uh, crafted some extra cold and lightning resistance on it defense wise we really have invested more in evasion than we have armor we have intuition here which gives us spell suppress evasion rating and life we have th these notes here which give us spell suppress and evasion and we have this note here which gives us Evasion, armor, and elemental resistances. And then down here, we have armor and elemental resistances. So technically, like you know, we really would have benefited more if we had a good chest that had both armor and evasion on it. But I just I couldn't afford to have our physical damage reduction be any lower than that. Because if we take this off, you know, that's 
Yeah, a huge blow to our physical damage reduction. So uh, even though we only have a 29% chance to evade, that gets good enough. <laughs> it's good enough for our purposes. It keeps us up. Also running a granite flask that is used any time that we use a healing flask. So we can, if it'll be used if we use our hallowed healing here or our hybrid healing here. In either case, this will be used, which gives us a large amount of extra armor and has a affix on it that increases our armor by a large percentage during the effect. So just a great overall utility to have for situations where we need to have as much armor as possible. We're also using dash for our escape skill and berserk to use up that rage that we build up. Not particularly for the extra damage and attack speed since we're getting plenty of that from the build itself, but more so for the less damage taken. You know, so the longer the fight's going on, the more benefit this has. And so, you know, like 19% less damage taken. That's a huge amount. That's a very large amount of reduced damage taken. I'm sorry, uh, of less damage taken. Yeah, so a very interesting build to get going, though it will be kind of hard fought to, like if you decide to go the unarmed route, uh, that'll be kind of hard fought to do. Because like I said, if you don't have both Facebreaker and the Rigwald's Curse, then a lot of that is just, like, you're like, honestly, I don't even really know how to build Facebreaker without this. Like, uh, when, like I have, like I said, I don't know how long ago I found this thing. But I know that when I did, and I looked up how unarmed attack were unarmed attacks work you know like i never wanted to try an arm, an arm build in this game because i didn't see any value in using this with the way that unarmed works unarmed builds are very difficult to pull off in this game so as i mentioned at the very beginning you're much better off like if you want to try this build you're much better off doing this with and with a weapon you know like just any weapon <laughs> is better than doing it this way. It's just that, you know, if you like, I'm just showing you because, you know, because my whole thing is that I like showing interesting interactions in Path of Exile. I don't care about overpowered interactions. I care about interesting interactions. And this is a very interesting interaction to be able to make unarmed attacks viable using claws, which makes sense. You know, you <laughs> claws are using your fists. So, I mean, personally, I'd rather that all claw nodes just apply to unarmed attacks. To me, that would make more sense as if, you know, like you didn't need to have a unique talisman to go and make, oh, uh, you're more effective at hitting things using your hands. You know, like it, it, it kind of makes sense that, you know, <laughs> the, the nodes that have to do with using a weapon that is used dealing damage using your hands should cause you to deal more damage using your hands you know <laughs> like the, it, it's nonsense that it's on a on a unique like they you know, like, like the only thing that this should do is give you that plus seven unarmed melee attack critical strike chance that's the only thing this should do for you or that should be a mastery that you have to invest in in the claws you know in the, in you know like you pick a claw node and there's a mastery that says unarmed attacks have a base uh, critical strike chance. You know, like, it, like, it, like it shouldn't require uniques to be able to pull off an unarmed build. You know, like I don't like that it requires uniques to do it, but I do enjoy the fact that we're able to at least do an unarmed attack build that is viable in Path of Exile even at endgame. Yep, but that's going to be it for this one. If you found these tips useful and appreciate doing all the YouTube stuff, like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, Bay Victus, Virus and Numeris, and bye.